loved animation since I was, uh, since I could remember. It was the thing I said I want to be when I grow up, and now I am. As a kid, you look at it and you take it in, in ways that you can't really explain and put in the words nowadays. Now you see it as a business and a technical process. Back then it was totally captivating because you didn't know what it was. In school, we had to draw what we wanted to be when we grew up, and I drew myself animating. The animator that I drew myself as was fat and bald and had a big moustache. My hair was brown for some reason and I was had a circuit board in my hand and I was pushing together two exposed wires that were sparking that was connected to a TV and it was making a cartoon frog appear on the TV. That was my understanding of being an animator. And I remember seeing the trailer for uh, Toy Story. I was like a 10 year old in the theater seeing this and I felt like standing up and being like, do y'all do just realize what's <laughs> happening right now? I think the moment where I realized it was something that I could do was either watching Wallace and Gromit and then there was an episode of um, of Muppet Babies where they like did, it was like all about stop motion and they had like a camera that would take like one frame at a time that their grandma had or whatever, their nanny, um, and then they were making stop motion and I was like, oh I could do that, I have a home video camera. I'd get like post-it notes and then just make little flip books and uh, and also I do it in like textbooks for school and stuff. Um, so I think that was my first delving into animation. I was familiar with animated GIFs and stuff like that. And one of the first things I saw was this dumbass thing. It was called um, Britney Spears Farts, I think. I was fascinated by it because it was an animated GIF with sound. I became aware then of Flash and of fi files that could fit on the internet. And that let you make this rich interactive content with sound and animation. Oh shit, stick cartoons. I mean, now it's kind of like it's so overdone, but back then it was just like, wow, this is this is wild, you know? And that sort of just set you know, the, the pace for everything after that. And there was, I said, okay, so there's a way that you could do this. And I think I saw that on Newgrounds. Newgrounds was a huge uh, part of that. I started the site, I guess it was, it was well, senior year of high school. We got free web hosting space from our ISP. Like you get like two megs with your dial-up internet access. And so I just immediately, you know, made a web page and started dumping stuff on it. The first game I made was Club of Seal, which uh, you know became kind of infamous. I am an animal lover, so it wasn't it wasn't meant to be that malicious. But just no one had made a seal clubbing game yet, so I, th I thought I'd tackle that. Guess what, Dad? Yesterday I had sex with my English teacher. Well, that's great, son. You're officially a man. So you're gonna do it again today? Nah, I wanna give my ass a few days to heal. I watched Newgrounds for a while, you know, ever since Assassin, mm -hmm. and then I learned what program it was, Flash, and I was like, oh, I could probably get that and do something with it. I skipped half of the 10th grade to sit at home and figure Flash out. I spent a lot of time just, just messing around with Flash. I'd, I'd get home from school and I'd unplug the phone at the right time so the school couldn't call. Everyone I've spoken to who has made any form of career independently with animation or games or whatever has mentioned Newgrounds. People are like, oh, all the animators know each other. What's up with that? It's like, it's because of Newgrounds. Like, the reason everybody knows each other is because we all went through the same thing on Newgrounds. So basically, the site got really popular for just the Flash stuff I was making around 1998. And I had a part of the site called The Portal, which is where I just dumped unfinished projects. And there was people that were making Flash, but they didn't have web hosting. Um, or they couldn't like support bandwidth if something was popular. 
and they'd ask me to, to put it up on the site, so I'd stick it in the portal, and it went from being my little personal dump to just being this growing list of other people's stuff that was being showcased. So we automated it so that people could just instantly publish, and that was the first time anyone could instantly publish a game or animation to the public. So it was really new and exciting. Eventually I made one that like caught on and people started watching and I was like, oh, maybe this is like a career or something. Shut up for Christ's sake, I know how to climb a ladder. Jesus, ow, my ear. Sorry, bruh. Thanks, Jesus. It's cool. When I made uh, Mega Man vs. Quick Man, I thought, you know, this is probably gonna go over well. I think people, people, you know, like Mega Man, I'm into Mega Man, blah, blah, blah. But seeing the response that it got, I got like 500, a uh, thousand I think with like in the first week or so and that like for a 15 year old kid it's like bigger than some television channel. Yeah, it's like yeah, you're a 15 really year old is. kid in, in your bedroom and you reach 500,000 people yeah I have this weird uh, vivid memory of going to my backyard we had a big trampoline just laying uh, on the trampoline and staring at the night sky and being like, what did I just do? This is <laughs> this is crazy. Like, I can't even, I can't process what's happening. When I released Metal Gear Awesome, I was pretty soon after contacted by um, MTV and they wanted, like, more shorts, the awesome shorts. That was my first, like, oh man, this is a career now. I didn't know about Newgrounds until later, until, like, 2010. I, I realized that every cartoon that I had been enjoying for several years um, on YouTube had been coming out of Newgrounds. So there was a period of time on, on where Newgrounds was really picking up and it had this all-star cast of people that were very much like, they're kind of like a new ground grandfather, elite kind of, you know, upper echelon, um, the stars of the show. I started doing things that no one, no one saw anywhere, um, but then I would work on them in my mum's office. These were the guys that then drew in the new audience. What are some of the most substantial pieces of content that blew you away? Adam Phillips, uh, when he came along with Bitey of Brackenwood and all those, he was, he was definitely showing people Flash, you know, could do more than just their idea. A lot of people had an idea of what web animation was. They kind of pictured some like gradient fills and, mm -hmm. and bad, bad, bad audio and stuff. But, so Brackenwood really showed people what was possible and, and inspired a lot of people. Yeah, Meat Boy was a big one that started on Newgrounds. The amount of time that was going into animations wasn't getting smaller, it was only getting bigger. And people were only getting older. The reality, as they got older as well, that I do need some money, I can't just do this for free. Eagle Raptor, Harry Partridge, Chris, David Firth, Weeble, all these guys migrated over to YouTube eventually. YouTube came around with the monetization and all that. Um, and then I posted uh, Awesome Reach on YouTube, and it was like hugely successful. The opportunities seemed endless, you know? And all of a sudden, once people started getting the idea that, wow, there is a ton of money there, um, you know, networks were able to give out minimum CPMs, like at $2.50 per thousand views, well, people were getting millions of views, you do the math. And then that was like, well, this is, this is absolutely my living now, like there's no, I've never made this much money in my life. Yeah! Are you ready? Ready doesn't even fucking describe it! If you're starting out on YouTube and you don't have already a following, it's very difficult because you're starting from the very bottom, right? If you have, let's say you're coming from a forum about Yu-Gi-Oh or something, I have no idea. Like, a, you're really big on the Yu-Gi-Oh scene and then you come to YouTube and you have a channel about Yu-Gi-Oh, you're gonna have 10,000 people that are gonna watch you off the, you know, from yeah. the beginning. Same with Newgrounds. When when Aaron and I and, uh, you know, Oni and all them were starting on YouTube, we had this big push um, of people and we found new people obviously on YouTube that weren't really using Newgrounds. It gave animators who would never have had the opportunity to reach as many people a venue to do that. It gave people a venue to build audiences. 
<laughs> Wingardium Leviosa. Stop it, Ron. Stop. It's Leviosa. Oh. Ah, oh, Leviosa. Oh. Oh. It was sad when they would stop uploading to Newgrounds. And when you talk to him, like I've talked to most of them about that stuff. It's never like any sort of like malicious type thing. It's more just like they didn't, they stopped making the time. I love that website to death. I mean, unfortunately I don't really post there anymore, but yeah. like I love Newgrounds. Like I, I owe so much to that website. You realize that about everyone. Like I'm a big fan of Eagle Raptor. I haven't actually watched like a, a lot of these Game Grumps videos. Like I haven't, um, you know, I, I would still say like, oh, I love Ego. I love everything he does. I want to hang out with Ego, but it's like, I'm not actively doing it. Cause you know, life, just your life moves forward and you get busy with things. And that's basically what happened with a lot of these guys is they just, their life moved forward and they got busy with YouTube and just sort of, even though the love didn't go away, they, it was just not a priority. You know, users started shifting um, where they were, you know, starting to browse through, you know, Facebook or, or watching their movies on YouTube or, or not really engaging in individual websites as much as they used to. They kind of get into these social communities and they, they kind of exist within them. YouTube was on everything. It's on your phone, it's in your emails, it's, you know, on Facebook, it's every, it's on Twitter, it's embeddable. It was, you know, like, it was just there. It was everywhere. If someone had told me, like, back in 2011 that, oh, you know, like, animation's gonna be dead t tomorrow yeah. on YouTube, I'd have been like, yeah. A lot of animators who were, who, were, who were starting to make a lot of money assumed that that, that train was gonna ride on forever. Yeah. You know, that they were able to fly off into the sunset and nothing was ever going to... It would only get better. It would only go up. But instead, it just exploded and crashed and imploded on itself. YouTube at the time was still a very new platform and as such was faced with people seeking to exploit the monetization system by inflating their view numbers. A notable example of this were people referred to as reply girls who would post quickly made low quality videos, typically with cleavage visible in provocative thumbnails, to lure people into clicking. In an attempt to combat videos like this, YouTube changed its monetization algorithm in 2012 so that instead of paying YouTubers for the number of views they gained, they instead paid per minute of the video watched. In theory, this would combat poor quality content cheating the system, but in practice, quality short form content faced an immediate disadvantage. It was, it was overnight, it was overnight, it was absolutely overnight. It wasn't just my analytics, I, I saw this and I had talked to people who work at different YouTube networks and they've said it was wow, just gone. Short form creative content was battling people who were willing to throw you know, tits and, and whatever in a thumbnail. Uh, the system that now was asking for longer content and more regular content, and then also gaming. In terms of the effort and time that goes into it, it's not comparable. You know, if you play video games like a Let's Player, you can kick out a video a day. Does independently produced animation have a future on YouTube? Quite frankly, I believe if things don't change, it won't. Not long after this time, Ross O'Donovan, also known as Rubber Ninja, created a video describing how this problem has a significant impact on animated content. His video gathered a lot of attention and helped raise awareness of the issue, especially for people entering into animation. So in the video that I put out, I basically brought to the attention of her, and it was interesting because randomly Mick put up a video while I was working on my video. We had not, we didn't even know we were both. That was completely no coincidence. Okay. Um, so I basically bring up, yes, like if you are a channel and you have to fight against frequency of uploads, minutes watched, and you're having a long production cycle, it is impossible to compete with these, 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 these channels. Like it's impossible, and it's it's not their fault because that content was popular prior to this change. It's just a matter of that content now flourishes in this new climate. Mm. So the thing with YouTube is they were not aware when they made this change. It was not an active attack on high produced content. If you go to Wikipedia and you search uh, um, a Reply Girls, right, mm. you'll get an article that will state that it is documented, it is fact, that YouTube changed the algorithm to a minutes watch model because of that abuse of the system. Mm. So in doing so, without even thinking, how could this affect uh, all these people on our platform? They killed the livelihood of thousands of channels overnight without even a second thought. It, it, it would have been easier back in 2011 and all that for animation on YouTube, but now, Every, every view you get on YouTube is war it's just, you need it. You absolutely need it. People started trying to manufacture viral videos. And to that end, there were certain recipes that worked to a degree. You know, doing things that are popular or topical, you know what I mean? Um, pushing it to the limit, like really 
I mean, just a shade away from being reported with your videos, you know what I mean? So there's a lot of people doing parody cartoons and so forth and so on, and I still don't... F there's very few people I know that are animating because they want to, and they're trying to dump their brains out. And a that's lot of purely because they've accessed an audience, or they know that they can. Yeah, exactly. By narrowing the... And they think that's the way that the audience, like, retaining an or um, developing an audience works through animation. And a lot of people can, and they're phenomenal animators, but... Who's to say they should be doing it? Mm. If you're talking strictly animation, that became blatantly obvious when YouTube changed their algorithm and people were making less money. You could still be an independent animator making what someone else wants you to make, but I think ultimately they want to make what they want to make. And it's hard to say how much that's going to change in the next few years in terms of like you know big money opportunities. My issue with this is that right now, and this is, the, this is the stuff they don't want you to hear, or they don't want to hear, mm -hmm. it is more profitable for a channel to go on Twitch and stream their animation process, not post it, stream the animation process, then post it, post the final content mm -hmm. on YouTube. Like for instance, you do a lot of tutorials, which is great because that's 10 minute I content. felt quite lucky when all this happened, Very I had a nice little niche yeah. that kept me safe from that. And that's yeah. kind of, because I mean, I had started on Game Grumps when it happened, so I felt very lucky as well, but I also felt it was important for me to speak out because I'm not someone who's affected by this. I wanted to be the one who would speak out and be like, this is bullshit. I know I'm not affected by it, but I have so many friends that are, because it's bullshit. The only reason I'm in the position I'm in is because I got lucky. Like, I, I, I started Game Grumps, you know, a couple months before the algorithm changed to favor what Game Grumps is, basically. They're going to lose those people. Like, there's so many people. It's not just animators. It's, 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 it's uh, sketch comedy. It's special effects. It's um, short film. These people... They're going to be gone. A lot of people that came out of that environment are, are, are a little bit ruined by it because it was, I think, an economy that was sus sustained only in that time period, especially with YouTube's algorithm being so beneficial for animators and then suddenly dropping off to be not at all beneficial to animators. Um, so you have people that are raised in this environment that sort of doesn't exist anymore. So now those people that came up in that environment are still very them centric um, when it really takes like collaboration and community to, to create something nowadays um, and that was sort of a hard realization that, that I had to make because I was one of those people I was very me centric and I was very my ideas are the best um, and it was sort of hard to start collaborating with other people and uh, listening to other people's ideas uh, objectively but you have to in order to, to build something because there's only so much that you can do. For a time, I was really enveloped in like the feedback and the comments and stuff, and I sort of hit like an emotional point, I think, where it was too stressful for me to do that um, and like be a human being. It's pretty narcissistic to like Google yourself every day, you know, and like look at pictures of yourself every day. Is it? <laughs> I've always just wanted to be a cool guy, so. <laughs> Like for, I don't know, since I was like 16, I was like, I'm Aaron, the cool guy. Yeah. And that was sort of always my aim. I was just like, all right, well, you know what? I'm not gonna expose myself to it at all. And I think that was a big change for me. If you're inspired by someone, yeah. you should let them know because most people don't think to actually say that. How do you balance the- I don't, there's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> there is no balance. It's a fucking struggle. You know, you see yeah. those dudes with the plates and the sticks going yeah. like this? That's all it is. You have um, column A, the people that would really want to see your stuff. And you have column B, the people that you think wants to see your stuff. So you start making things for them, and they're like, oh yeah, this is great. And these guys are like, where's, where's the stuff? And you're like, okay, I'll go back to these guys. It's like, where, where's the stuff? So it's like, a, you can't please both sides of it. So you might as well do what you yeah. want to do anyways, because at this point, you're just spending years making Minecraft cartoons and shit that you don't care about anyway. Sometimes you feel like the era has passed. You know, we had our our big period where you had like Eagle Raptor and Edmund McMillan and all these big stars come up and, and it's easy to, to think that that passed. But I also very focused on the fact that there's a bunch of young animators that you know want their chance too. So you don't want to lose sight, you, know, you don't want to get so fixated on you know what, what was there and lose sight of what's still coming. Now they're growing up like I did, but they have something to beat now. They have something to look up to, and, and they're doing it. Like their first cartoons are fucking amazing. There's not, there's, there, there are, there's a couple of kids that when they were 14, they were doing all the art and programming and music and sound for their own games, and they were great games. Mm. It's because a standard was set and it was attainable. Mm. It was software that you could get, 
And if you had the time and the patience and the care, you could sit at home and do whatever you wanted. I still think there's a value in the YouTube market in terms of building an audience, getting eyes on your work, getting people to believe in what you do. And even if you're not making the money, you have the genuine supporters of what you do. Just give them everything as, as much as you can. And then ask for the support and see what happens. You know, I mean, it's, it's always going to be a tough racket. I will still say that to this day, it's amazing what people are doing independently. There's whizzes out there, like the, these kids who are just learning animation at an earlier and earlier age just because of all the information. I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of you know, crowdfunding is this whole thing now where, where if you're passionate enough and you get enough people to see your vision, you can, you can go places. Now with the internet, there's so, like, animation in any form has a chance, which is really exciting. Like, if, if you're really good at 3D or 2D or claymation or stop motion, whatever you want to do, there's a place for that and you can help, you can find an audience for that. What's bumming me out is that with the push of gaming and the very apparent um, lack of support, um, financial support especially, for animation, that there are fewer and fewer people motivated to even try animating. I'm just curious how many people are sitting around trying to be Let's Players that could be the next Harry Partridge, but they're not motivated to. A lot of people get into animation because they think it's fun, but do they like storytelling? Do they want to be a, a script writer? Do they want to be a, a movie director? Do they want to actually make cartoons, or are they just trying to be popular? It's going to force people to be more specific, because you're either going to do it or you're not now. It's not just like random people making funny cartoons and becoming popular. Now's the most exciting time, I think, for animation. Um, and it's just a matter of, of you know, bootstrapping and, and getting there. So, but yeah, it's, it's, it's great. It's also super satisfying. I mean, it's frustrating and, and time consuming, but uh, putting something in motion versus just like drawing something, it's a very unique feel to it. Make it for you first and you will always find an audience. I just feel like animation has unlimited potential to explore anything and everything, literally. It's cheesy as it sounds, it's absolutely true. I think most people like cartoons and animation and it's a super valid art form and I think it'll go on forever. There's something about animation that's very satisfying to do um, creatively and like how you spend your time, you know? On the smaller scale, the, the parodies and whatnot, the reason for those is not necessarily to take the piss out of anybody, it's really just to entertain, you know? Give some somebody a reason to laugh or chuckle or smile or whatever, and, and maybe think a little bit. But I think on a grander scale, in terms of storytelling, it is it is changing people, even if it's just the seed of an idea. How do you feel emotionally? Where do you go when you're creating? <laughs> um, well, that's kind of a dark answer, but... Um... Life gets a little complicated for me sometimes. I stack thoughts on a little too much. For me, content creation and animation is an escape from all that. It gives, it, it shuts my brain off so I don't have to worry about things or people anymore. But the outcome is always pleasant. People who may or may not be in the same boat as I am will be entertained. I know what it's like to have a shitty day. I know what it's like to suffer depression. And the one thing you want to do is come home and just sit and laugh at something. Mm -hmm. So it's a positive for me, and I feed off that. You know, I don't get it when you know, the other guys are like, I got the shittiest fucking email today. I get great emails all the time, man. <laughs> I'll, I'll say it right there. I get great emails. I get all kinds of thoughtful stuff from soldiers and people that are... In dark times, that with, with something so small, a, th a 30 second cartoon that you made just changed all their shit around. It's great. It means so much. Like I was having the worst day. You know, my dad died, but you, you made me crack a smile. It's like, well, okay. <laughs> That's great. I'm glad I did that. These animators started out because they found a passion for storytelling through animation, using new and exciting tools. Making money from animation is hard, and the industry has had its ebbs and flows, but I believe that there has never been a more exciting time for independent animators than today. There are unlimited stories that can be told, and unlimited ways to tell them. The technology available to us allows anyone to find their voice in animation, and the internet in the age of digital distribution allows anyone to make a way for their voice to be heard.
Okay. I have a question for you. Okay. If you had to kill your entire family <laughs> to save your own life, would you do it? No. Oh, that's a good, that's a good answer. I w- yeah, that's, that's pretty simple. I wouldn't do it either. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching and supporting my content. Make sure to check out the other parts to the Tale Tellers mini documentary series on independent animation by clicking the annotations on the screen or in the description. And if you haven't already, make sure to like and share this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to my channel for more art and animation content. Until next time, I'll see you later.